people of the internet, my name is Johnny and welcome back to another game theory reaction. So the new book is out 1.35 a.m. It's the third book in the Fazbear Fright series and if you can't tell by the lack of a bookmark, no, I haven't started reading it yet. So I know nothing about this book. I know that there was apparently a lot of lore in it, apparently there's something to do with the shadow characters and Maybe something to do with Golden Freddy because he's the attraction, he's the main attraction of this game theory. Then again, when is he not? So yeah, I have no clue <laughs> what uh, this book contains. I've not seen any videos on it. Um, like I said, I haven't read it yet. So I'm going in completely blind, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. That really just means that I don't know what Matt is going to talk about. So. Oopsies on my part. Anyway, so the name of this game theory is FNAF Golden Freddy, not what we thought. So apparently Golden Freddy is in 1.35 AM. I guess that makes sense because uh, Darko's video about the last chapter did have Golden Freddy in the thumbnail. So I guess he is in the book and apparently he's not what we thought. So let's not waste any more time and let's hop right into game theory FNAF Golden Freddy, not what we thought. All right, here we go. No clue who this is. is there room for one more? That's one of the chapters, I know that. <laughs> I think it's about the Minuinas, I know they're in the book. Yeah, yeah, it is the Minuina. These books are weird! These books are so creepy and weird. Internet. Welcome, Welcome to, to Game Book Theory. Book because theory. if you have one moderately popular indie smash game in your franchise, chances are you also have yourself a 10 installment book deal. It's crazy Zero how many books FNAF has. Bending the Ink Machine, three. With more promise on the three way. Three books? Hello Jesus. Neighbor, six. Heck, it's a surprise that Dude, no one Basics really likes doesn't that. have an entire okay. trilogy dedicated to the horrific backstory of the Jump Rope Girl. Make me Dude, I would read that series. My life, I'm reading I more video games than I'm playing. But of course, today we're not talking about any of those other franchises. Oh, we're talking about the Grandpappy, the one that paved the way for all those who would dare to follow in its footsteps. You're welcome. Five Nights at Freddy's and its eight books, as well as its two graphic novel uh -huh. reimaginings of the first two books. But here's the best part, your friends. True to this franchise, the books were supposed to end. There is seven five. now. Currently at Fazbear Frights number three. Most likely. Eight. Eight. Was in sight. That was gonna be it. That was the end of the line. Nope. Mystery over. But oh, oh no, my oh, friends. No. Of course not. Now there are two more final installments. Final. Just like every game <laughs> after. <laughs> I know, right? Like Scott, come on, man. It's the joke that the fan was the scariest part of this franchise. No. Oh no, not anymore, dear theorists. Now it's multi-platform merchandising. Hey, look, it's so FNAF AR. Fazbear Frights number three, titled One Thirty Five. 5 a.m. just came out and oh boy there is a lot to talk about with this one if you remember scott has made it sorry i can't join in on the discussion meant to help us solve the mysteries from the past I remember that. that the stories are as they say in every book's official description pulled from all different corners of the fnaf lore but unlike the past two fazbear frights books where the connections have been a bit uh, looser i suppose Loose. is the best way to describe a time traveling ball pit that leads to a scene of some 1985 pizzeria murders the stories yep. contained in this one in 1 35 a.m all feel very strongly connected to, well, like I just said, every corner of the FNAF canon. Mm. The stories here are starting to show how they're connected to not only each other, but also how they're connected to the original book trilogy, and yes, how they're even connected the to games. the games, oh, creating boy. this elaborate web of complicated animatronic death. But more than anything else, these books are We're gonna have to make to like a... Who cares about the timeline? Let's make the FNAF web. The part of the last five years, which, you know, is kind of nice to receive some level of validation. Like I said, it is a lot to cover, and so I'm going to cover this one like I've covered the last two books. Today's episode is going to be dedicated to a general overview of the story, mm -hmm. spotlighting some of I'm the pretty sure Matt is doing another theory what I think this new soon of stories is on 135 AM. Series is mysteries, and then the next video we're going to yeah. be doing a deep yes. dive into probably so the it's a biggest mystery of Yay. all three Yay! So I mean, far. of course it Matt's is. Matt's newest killer animatronic, The Stitch Wave. This guy is actually really interesting, and his story is starting 
to weave through most of the nine other small stories that we've covered in Ooh, these other books. Nine what boys. What means might actually have some severe implications for not just the original trilogy of novels, but also the future of the game. Security like I said, breach. That next week, but for today, have let's you guys start seen the new teaser? It's great. 1 35 a.m. This one is pretty straightforward. Delilah is a young woman with a tragic backstory. Her parents both died when she was 11, at which point she was bounced around and abused sadly in the foster care system for years. Eventually, she finds a stable home and happiness with a man named Richard. They get married, and Delilah excitedly looks forward to finally having a child of her own so she can finally complete the family Again, that she Again, I don't know had. these stories, Everything so I'm learning about them for the first time right here. Divorces her. Now she's alone and sadder than ever. And then she dies, trapped in a ventilation shaft after being tortured by the embodiment of the child that she never had. Children's is, is that, entertainment, is that the dead body in, in sister okay, location so that the team talks about? I'm sorry. Steps there, but it's roughly the idea. One day, Delilah finds an animatronic doll named Ella at a garage sale. A doll that Just reminds like her of the child that she always dreamed of having. Quote, with brown curly hair, big dark eyes, and plump pink cheeks, the doll looked almost exactly like the baby Delilah had envisioned having someday with Richard. She'd hmm. been sure that she was going to be a mother. So sure that she'd named the baby before the baby was even conceived. Her name would be Emma. Delilah reached for the tag that hung on the doll's wrist. My name is Ella. Ella. So Sounds close very to close. Delilah felt an odd tingle slither through her body. End quote. She buys the doll, in part because it reminds her of her almost never child, and because it has a built-in alarm clock. Emotionally scarred hey. with a side of functionality just the way I like it. Anyway, she <laughs> sets the approved. alarm inside of Ella for 1.35 p.m. to help wake her up for her shift at hey, work. But second. the alarm doesn't go off. And just like that, Delilah gets her first taste of parental disappointment. So she does what any good parent would do in that situation, immediately hurls her would-be child into the nearest huh. dumpster. Sounds you know, like she would Delilah. be a great Maybe it's mother. Better that you and Richard didn't have that kid after all. Yeah. Anyway, that night she's awoken Yikers. at 1 35 a.m. Hey. Delilah assumes that she accidentally That's set the alarm for a.m. rather than p.m., which reminds me of the time I didn't bother to set the clock right on my Tamagotchi and was forced to scoop his poop every day at four in the morning. I can't imagine why he died. Sucks. Certainly not my fault. Anyway, she tries to find the trashed Ella doll, but can't. And from that point forward, is slowly driven insane by the doll waking her up every morning at 1 35. I mean, 1 35 is still early enough at night to get a decent night's sleep. It's not a three. That's about what time I go to bed. Whatever. Not yeah, healthy, I don't suggest she'll it. never feel safe again, she climbs into a ventilation shaft in a building under construction and dies. Quote from the book, She'd never wanted things, she wanted love. Oh. Oof, it is a heartbreaker, man. The stories in these books so far have been pretty sad, but this one is just tragic. All in in fact, all just... three stories from this Ouch. particular book are just rough. Now, this story has two really important details in it. Details uh. that seem to make Delilah's horrific struggle a Ooh. strange nexus point for both the original book canon as well as the games. So let's start yep. with the books first. In it's gonna be the body. AM, the Ella doll is described as a quote helper doll manufactured by Fazbear Entertainment. Continuing hmm. forward with that quote, the booklet had a list of what Ella was designed for. She could keep time and serve as an alarm clock, manage Makes appointments, sense. keep track of lists, take photos, read stories, sing songs, and even serve drinks. Serve Ooh. drinks. Delilah shook her head. Now in the games we never really get to learn much about Henry. Sounds kind of similar to animatronics, Maybe but in the besides novel, the soap drinks. Silver eyes, twisted ones, and fourth closet, we get to meet not only his daughter Charlie, but also some of his other creations, mm. including, wouldn't you know it, a doll named Ella, who hey, is built that. to serve tea. From the silver that eyes novel, true. quote, out sailed Ella Sorry. on her track, a child-sized doll bearing a teacup and saucer in her tiny hands like an offering, end quote. Now, across all tea. three novels, we never get a solid physical description of the Ella doll, but until the, the fed novel, the files which collects all the main information about the franchise we Nailed do it. get to see our first illustration hey. of the doll and wouldn't you know it everything matches the description of Delilah's little garage sale find from 1:35 a.m. quote again wearing a puffy sleeved 1980s era bright blue full skirted dress with pink Ooh, ruffled all those adjectives all around the waist end quote it's the same doll meaning that this first story is happening in the novel timeline after the events of Fort God damn Scott. Somehow, this is the doll that Henry created for his daughter Charlie, 
who I need to technically remind you is his daughter. Because again, remember, his daughter died at a young age, and he replaced tough her crowd, with a series crowd. of four robots that represent Charlie growing up at yeah. various ages. So Ella technically is an early version of his own daughter. Kind of weird. Throw that little fact <laughs> in there, since, you know, uh, this is a real and totally valid plot point from the novelized series of events in this very easy to understand series. But that's not Scott, all. Man. While I was reading He's the story, insane. the way Delilah decides to hide in the ventilation shaft felt really strange to me. Like, why? It was super random, but also was one of those things that felt so oddly specific that it felt like it had to have had a bigger purpose. So I and dug around did. and found this for you. For your consideration, I present to you Night 2 of yes. Sister Location. So, funny, funny story. story. A dead time. body was found in this vent once. It's not that funny. Okay, so it is a story, not though. not that funny, but it's a story. So... Could Delilah be that body that was actually found in the vents of Circus Babies Entertainment? Could Rentals? be. Maybe, but oh. probably more likely it's alluding to that story from Sister Location rather than directly the same one. You see, in the book, we're told that Delilah's vent is in a site that's under construction, a three-story structure that feels a bit like an office building. Sister Location, meanwhile, takes place office. in an underground facility underneath a residential home, so it's probably not the same building. At the same huh. time, though, the story yeah. makes it clear that Delilah was drawn to this place. Quote, the answer to her plight was in here. She was sure of it. Someplace here, she was going to find a way to escape Ella forever. End quote. Time and again throughout all of these Fazbear Fright stories, we're shown people being drawn to the Freddy Fazbear yeah. locations through some supernatural force. So it's could Delilah, so strange. or whoever died in the vents of sister location, have been compelled it's like being to come hypnotized. there? And this story is just giving us a hint like as to how that Freddy. happened. Maybe. And whereas the Maybe. Delilah sister location connection might just be me reading too far into things, that certainly isn't true. For that does seem story. like a pretty room for one more in this story. And stop if any call. of this sounds familiar. Stanley is a night guard at a mysterious underground facility full of little ballerina dolls looking to escape to the surface. I don't dang, know. Dang, dang. It's like in one huh. sentence we just one FNAF That just came out of nowhere. I have no clue where I've heard of that before. Wakes up to find a mini Rena doll on the desk, asking to go home with him. Stanley and he falls asleep again. Would you take that home? Up, I would have taken that home. Gone. Over the next few days, his arms start to swell. His throat starts to bleed. And yet, he keeps going to work, keeps finding dolls, and keeps As you would. asleep. Eventually, he learns that the dolls have been crawling into his mouth while he sleeps, causing his body to hmm. swell to the point. Kind of like night four in sister the location. The moral of this story, kiddos, be I swear, I don't know these stories. Don't sleep on the job. I've not Otherwise, read them. I just know. I think he tells. going to crawl into you and make you explode from the inside out. What's also if you consider the main story, story is Stanley's dreams. Each time he sleeps while on duty, he has himself a strange dream. In the first, fun time Foxy is a cab driver. In the second, <laughs> I saw that on Doc's thumbnail. Comes face to face on his Reddit. Freddy. And in the last one, Ennard is a dentist and Ballora is his dental assistant. Which <laughs> I would say is one of the strangest <laughs> things to ever appear in this franchise, but then again, I turn your attention to this corner where we have time traveling ball pit. Dab and Chica. Foxy, Yandere Chica. Anyway, this I was cool. is I got the obvious, Chica. right? Stanley is working at Circus Babies Inter Entertainment and rentals, that underground facility from Sister Lucy. It's really small in that the elevator. Falling yeah. into his mouth are a parallel to Ennard using Michael's progressively decaying body as a skin suit in that game's secret ending. I feel like this story might be trying too. to give us a more realistic interpretation of those events, or something that more closely matches what we see happening in those ending cutscenes. That instead of Michael being scooped and having his skeleton removed and all of that at the same time, that our protagonist Michael instead is being slowly filled up with animatronic hmm. pieces night after night, giving him that progressive sickly look that scares all the people around him. Stanley's story uh, yeah, even yeah. mentions this, quote, he staggered and stumbled down the sidewalk. Passers-by stared, some seeming mm, worried, yeah, others that's... just annoyed, like it instantly yeah, that's way too to similar. another person suffering, which feels right on point with how those cutscenes were depicted in Sister Location. But okay, of the three stories in one third... I, I don't like pausing, and I know you guys don't like it when I pause um, either, but I do just want to say, um, and I'm pretty sure I saw this on some reddit docos or the regular fnaf one but it is also very similar to night four i said this um and someone did the calculations i don't know if it's 100 percent true but in night four i think we all remember because it was completely tedious and everyone hated it um you have the minorinas crawling so you're in the spring suit and you have the minorinas crawling up on your sides and then you have some crawling like right in front of you and someone did some math i don't again don't know how accurate it is but it does appear that those minorinas are crawling right around your mouth area. So, that story could also be a callback to Night 4. I'm just saying, I'm just tacking on some information. I'm not saying that's wrong. 
I think I like I didn't know about the walking down the sideway part so that is very accurate I'm not saying it's wrong I just thought it was interesting so there's my mini game theory 35 a.m. It's Continue. story number three, New Kid. That's the most exciting to talk about, at least for today's episode, because this Yay. one gets to the heart of what is still to this day the single biggest question of the series, and that is the identity of Gold Golden Freddy. Freddy. Let me tell you, I thought we had this one pretty well nailed down. That is it, it not Cassidy? Cassidy? AKA the vengeful spirit from Ultimate Custom Night. And yet, the this one you story, should not have killed. Well, it causes me to question a few things about our conclusion. Uh, First, Scott. let's go through a quick summary. Devin is a ninth grade social loner alongside his only friend Mick. Mick. One day, a new kid in school named Kelsey shows interest in spending time with the two of them. Kelsey is good looking, he's charismatic, he immediately attracts the attention of all the cool Damn, kids in school. Boy. And even though Kelsey hey, Devin and Mick all get along as friends, eventually Devin gets jealous of Kelsey because Kelsey has everything that Devin wants. And so to get some revenge, oh. he lures him to an abandoned Freddy's restaurant long forgotten at the outskirts of the town. His plan is to trap Kelsey in a spring lock suit for a few hours to scare him, but well, you know what's gonna happen. The sheer Colton flashbacks immediately gives you a spoiler alert as to what's gonna go down. Kelsey puts on the golden Freddy suit. Oh no, steward alive. Hey, that's not good. The blood saturated the bear's matted fur in seconds and began pooling on the floor. That's Devin not good. Stared at the moving blood. It looked like it oh, that's cool. Thing. That's good effect there, editors. Red liquid lake stretching out. Ugh. Mick and Devin leave Kelsey for dead for fear of Devin getting in trouble, but they're not quite sure he actually died. Nearly a week later, Devin is convinced to go back and check on Kelsey, but when check he does, he's in for surprise. Right. Kelsey has vanished. Devin eventually sticks his hand inside the suit's Wait, mouth the body's to feel gone? for Kelsey's slumped over dead body, only for the spring locks to fail again and crush his arm. As Devin lies on the floor, trapped and slowly bleeding to death, he gets a final glimpse into the suit and, well, let's just say what he sees inside rocks the foundation of what we know about this franchise. Quote, Devin wiggled in one more attempt to free himself. The mouth opened even more and Devin got a sudden glimpse inside the suit. He gasped. Down low, past his arm, Devin could see a body, a dead body, just like he thought he'd find when he came back here to check. But it wasn't Bye. exactly like he thought he'd find. This one had curly black hair. Yes. The body in the suit wasn't Kelsey. Now there's a lot that, of weird things about this. Does Cassie have curly black hair? Have answers for, but I do have some thoughts about. First and foremost is the ending. You see, the book doesn't end with Devin's death like you oh. expect. It actually continues to a final scene with Kelsey alive and well as the new kid at school introducing himself to two boys. It seems at a first reading that seems like, like a, be a flashback to when Kelsey first like a meets Devin, with Devin at school. Like oh, this was like a bendy 414 lead to multiple of their deaths. But it's situation. Not this is Kelsey at a new school meeting two new boys. In the story, Mick meets Kelsey first and then brings Kelsey over to meet Devin. And it all takes place in a classroom. This closing scene, meanwhile, is outside the front door. I don't of know the about this, And the boys. two boys Kelsey introduced himself to are less social outcasts like Mick and Devin and more like bullies. We're expressly told hmm. the boys are snickering at the passing kids. Even Kelsey's bullies, first you line say? Them is different. FNAF 4? It implies that Kelsey bullies? has somehow lived on after his supposed spring trap death golden freddy and now he's the new kid at yet another new school introducing himself to two new kids and the way that this final scene is written with kelsey scoping out the two boys from afar before he approaches them it feels like he's actively targeting loner kids to make friends with could this be Kelsey's attempt to befriend kids that most overlook and then lure them back to a Freddy's pizzeria for some tragic incident to happen? It seems like it would be a stretch, but let's talk about Kelsey himself. Mr. Perfect. Kelsey is a weird entity in all this. Throughout the story, entity. there are moments when his behavior is specifically called out as slightly off. Quote from the book. Kelsey tilted his head and studied Devin for a couple of seconds. For those two seconds, Devin had the weird feeling he was being evaluated. And again later, Devin was tempted to stab Kelsey to see if he was a robot. Kids don't say stuff like that. Once they're actually at the pizzeria, things go surprisingly sure. smoothly for Devin's plan. The line in the book even goes like this, quote, This was going even better than he imagined. He thought he was going to have to talk Kelsey into trying on the Golden Freddy suit, but it looked like he was going to do it all on his own. It hmm. was like it was meant to be. All of it seems Kelsey, to you sneaky boy. on Kelsey's true motivations. And that's without me even mentioning the fact that his body just goes 
goes missing at the end of the book when it has been skewered and bled to Golden death. Golden Freddy doesn't it have feels a like Kelsey may just be body in him, does he? Spirit from Ultimate he has an endoskeleton. In the story, Kelsey is described as having wavy blonde hair and blue eyes. Now, we have a pretty solid idea that its hair is straight with a slight wave, and it appears to be blonde. But here's the kicker. This image That's was Scott's by kid. inverting colors. It's what gives it that blown out it's kind Jason. of appearance. If you invert the colors of the vengeful spirit's eyes, you get blue, just like Kelsey is described in the book. And it would mm. fit the idea of a vengeful spirit, a kid who is angry at his own death. In an I don't know about that tattoo, just because in this particular story, the vengeful spirit revenge on is other kids who are similar Scott's real-life kid. He goes from school to school, presumably ones near Fazbear locations. Like that picture is a picture of Jason, Scott's actual suit. kid. Parallels with vengeful spirit even Unless Scott edited it, Kelsey's edited death. the colors, I'm not, how it's described. not sure about the that sound one. wasn't the bad part. It was bad, yes, but the bad part, the really, really bad part, was the way the suit started jerking. In a spastic, horrific dance. Not making any like jokes. Eaten, mildew blotched gold bear was convulsing, but it wasn't the bear, it was Kelsey. It's remarkably similar to the final cutscene yep. of Ultimate Custom Night, where we see again an angry Golden Freddy, presumably filled with the vengeful spirit, twitching off into the darkness. Also worth noting is that the Springlock suits are apparently big enough for kids to slump down into the body. Devin, when he initially can't find Kelsey's body inside the suit, decides to dig deeper down into it. Quote, had Kelsey somehow slid down into the suit? Was that his hair that Devin could see? This, to me, confirms what so we see weird. in FNAF 4's storage room cutscene. Hey! Hair that's coming out of the body of the suit. Back to Didn't Devin, even think about that. Sure Hell yeah, man. Tell us what that tuft of hair was meant to be but now we knew it was hair all along right that it is indeed a child stuffed into that body and that we're only seeing the top tuft of hair poking out Can we get a theory on just how many kids have died in the franchise that'd be awesome and that the crying child was somehow aware of at least one if not multiple of past victims that's why he's scared right but all of this brings us to the obvious Probably. question of this story. The curly black hair at the bottom of the suit. Who's that? And honestly, I'm not sure. Cassidy, which is what we've been assuming to be Golden I thought Freddy's it was name, Cassidy, but I guess not. Does indeed have black hair, but it's always been described as long and straight. Has it? In the closet, we physically see Cassidy, and she's described as this. Quote, that's Cassidy, a girl with long black hair approach. And in the survival logbook, where we first learned of Cassidy's I'm talking name, about the survival logbook. Again, as long, black, oh, she hair. does. That's I'm an idiot, so I guess. For as chaotic as the story in this franchise has been for all its iterations, too many and characters to keep track of. of the victims seem to be fairly consistent. Susie is always associated with Susie, been a while. She has blonde hair with curls and blue eyes. Cassidy always appears to have straight black hair. Fritz always has freckles. The names and the faces of the surrounding characters may change, but the missing children all seem to be fairly consistent in both name and physical description, which is an important detail to keep track of moving forward. So could all of this mean that Vengeful Spirit and Cassidy are two separate entities? That two spirits might both be in possession of Kind of like Dog Applier. Cassidy isn't really associated with Golden Freddy at all, and is instead the identity of one of the other animatronics. Because in Fourth Closet, she technically wasn't the one who was associated with Golden Freddy. Honestly, I don't know. I need to actually mm. review the evidence for this one, and I encourage you to do the same. The last yeah, thing worth mentioning for all of us to chew on is the mysterious slithering that's heard throughout this story. While the boys are exploring the abandoned pizzeria, they hear something inexplicable in the walls. Quote, while they were in the bathroom, Devin was pretty sure he heard something slithering through the walls. He didn't say anything. From the way the other boys' faces paled, he knew they heard it too. They didn't mention it either. It's never mentioned again. <laughs> Nothing ever comes of this strange little detail, but it's clearly important because more inexplicable strange sounds come from the Freddy torso after Kelsey dies. In a later quote, did you leave anything else? He tried to ignore the fact that the scuttling sound was coming from the, the bear suit. Now, this is after Kelsey has already stopped squirming and twitching. So again, we're left with some mysterious force moving around hmm. the pizzeria, creating these sorts of sounds. Is it Ennard? Is it the stitch? 
trade, visit something else. Like I said, lots to chew on with this particular book, but as you can tell, Jeez. it's given us pretty I'm explicit spooked. information about some I'm of the spooky. biggest questions that this series has had. Now it's up to us, as always, to put all those pieces together. Serious unite! A lot of pieces that'll start coming uh... together next time as we start looking into the power of agony and the twisted timeline of FNAF's next newest murderer, the Stitch Raid. So make sure you hit that subscribe button to get notified when that video comes out next week. Oh, and in the meantime, nice do me a favor, remember, it's just a theory. A, a game, game theory. theory. Thanks for watching. So, I have a feeling... Okay, so, I, I, I want to quickly theorize here. This is a personal theory. Um, Kelsey is a male, and Cassidy is a female. And in one of Matt's old theories, um, he talks about how Golden Freddy is referred to as a male, but has... If, if Golden Freddy does have Cassidy's spirit in him... He can also be referred to as a female when you're talking about the spirit. So maybe all along, you know how Matt said that the male part was just referring to Golden Freddy being a Freddy version? You know, Freddy being a male, so that's why I would call him a male. Maybe that's talking about Kelsey? I really don't know. Honestly, it's a pretty bad theory. This is why I'm not Mad Pat. But, um, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to think about. But this one, this was solid. Um, I knew- wait, hold on. Let me- let me switch to, like, full face cam. Yeah, so this game theory in particular was very, very solid. I knew going into this game theory that the book, 135AM, already had a lot of lore in it. So I was expecting a really deep dive into this book. And I'm actually glad that Matt is doing another part, a second part of this book, because it has a lot of lore. Again, I haven't read it yet, but based off of what Matt has said, and based off of what I have seen, it it seems like there's a lot there's a lot of lore to pick apart. And you you also gotta keep in mind, this is book three out of a out of seven or eight, most likely eight, because the first collection had four books, and it wouldn't make sense to have collection two be only three books. So this is three out of most likely eight. That is not even halfway there. I do think these books are going to fill in a lot of holes. A lot of plot holes from the games, from maybe even the original trilogy, if we want to go off of what Matt has been talking about. I feel like they're, they are going to answer a lot of questions, um, but they're also going to create more questions. Like, Kelsey, what happened with his body? The things in the walls, the frick are those? You know, it... It's interesting. It's like we're gonna need Fazbear Frights 2, book number 1 through 8, to uh, fill in those plot holes. That, that's a joke, obviously. God, can you imagine another Fazbear Fright series? That would be insane. Yeah, but th this game theory, I loved it a lot. I don't know if it was better going into the video not knowing anything, as opposed to having already read the book, which I totally meant to read the book. But I accidentally ordered uh, Into the Pit again, instead of getting the, this book, so I got the wrong book, so that's why I wasn't able to read it in time, but I definitely, definitely am going to read it. Hopefully, I'll have it done by next game theory, but I don't think that's going to be the case, unfortunately. Yeah, this one, very solid. I liked it a lot. Honestly, I can't wait for part two, because there's a lot of lore in these books, and I think it's very interesting where Scott is going with these books. I'm also very interested to see how Matt connects this all to Security Breach, which is coming out later this year. Um, that, that would be very interesting if the books, if the book before Security Breach kind of like pave, paves the way for it. I think that would be very interesting, but I have a feeling it's probably not going to do that just because these are specifically looking at the past. I hit myself with the book. Um, but yeah, these are looking at the past not really so much about the future. But anyways, I've been talking for quite a bit. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss next reaction. And I will see you all on the flip side. Goodbye.